You're listening to the Low Pressure Podcast, the podcast for skiers. Presented by CMH Heli Skiing and Peak Performance. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me in your shop. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the uh, Piotr shop here. The Piotr shop. Now, is this your first podcast? This is my first podcast, yeah. Nice. The exclusive. (laughs) The exclusive. Uh, I thought it was funny that your mom was like, Logan, what did you get yourself into today? He's like, this isn't my thing. <laughs> this is dad's thing. Yeah, he called me. I thought he called you. It was kind of a little... Uh, I was kind of, honestly, I was... With, playing with us. Absolutely, I was. <laughs> 100, 100%. Because I know that, uh, you know, like you just said, you thought podcasts. What did you just explain podcasts? I thought it was just a, a voice thing. I didn't know they filmed them at all. Yeah, yeah film them. Yeah. It's just chatting, stuff like that. So I knew... I'm like, all right, how am I going to, because you said you'd be down to do it, but I don't want to hassle you either. So I'm like, all right, I gave you a shout. And you're like, I remember you originally telling me that you want to do it with Logan. So I called Logan. I wasn't playing you off each other. I knew you guys were both in, but I was like, all right, how's it working? He's going to be the details guy. As long as you tell me what time <laughs> works for you, I'll work on the details with him. Just talk to him. Yeah. yeah and, then we're, <laughs> and then we're all set. Uh, so we're in uh, Pemby in your rad shop. Do you have a name for this place? No, no, Piotr Palace, man, that's what we call it. There you go, Piotr Palace. <laughs> and then uh, you've got the jet boat in the corner. Yeah. A lot of people uh, watching this right will know, I guess it was last year that you built it or the year before? Is, you, is it? Yeah, I think it's three. Two or two. Ago. Yeah. Two so you pretty ago. much built the jet boat from scratch. Yeah, minus uh, the company Jetstream that cuts and bends the hull. And then you got to weld it together. It just comes like on a pallet all flat. Oh, so the, it's like a almost like a kit boat. Yeah, exactly. Almost like a kit almost. boat. <laughs> There's a little refinement. So before yeah, yeah. we go too far, so just so people know why we're talking about jet boats, is you operate Whistler Jet Boating. I do, Whistler Jet Boating, yep. Yeah. Right out of Pemberton here, the uh, Meadows at Pemberton Golf Course, Sunstone Golf Club. And uh, yeah, we've been running since 1995. So for people that don't know what a jet boat is, like how is it different from a regular boat? You want to go? You're the jet boat. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Lord. jet boats. Uh, yeah, it's an impeller instead of a propeller that hangs below the base of the hull. Impeller. Uh, similar to a jet ski. I think everybody's pretty familiar with jet skis. Mm-hmm. So a jet ski in a big application. Uh, my boat has a big V8, 383 stroke with a big pump on it, big fire hydrant that comes out of the back. Yeah. And to turn the boat, you redirect the flow of the water that turns the boat. So you're able to go over really shallow uh, water. Uh, Isn't it like three or four inches or something? Some yeah. some will run on wet grass. Yeah, really, <laughs> really, really. Have you tried? Well, not on this big tour boat. On but tour boat. One of the these little ones can go on anything. Just on a, a rainy November in, <laughs> yeah, in Whistler, pretty much. Pretty much yeah. Some kids at the high school are like, "What's going on?" This <laughs> boat and baseball diamonds. Yeah. So when did you when did you start doing that? What made you want to start operating tours in jet boat? Well, I guess 1995. Uh, I got my wife pregnant. And uh, I needed a real job, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the best thing I can say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much, I've been working for them. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, it just kind of snowballed. I actually worked for a guy, Steve Anderson, that used to own and started the company. Yep. And then eventually we bought it off, and he got tired of doing it. We just got, had our own jet boat at the time, and we just restructured it. Smaller boat, owner operator, just me, Farv, and the kids, and. Uh, yeah, I think we've been running about 15 years now. Yeah. yeah, nice manageable. I've been on a couple trips yeah, been yeah. With, with our with our buddy Toby. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, yeah. yeah good times. Good times. There, brother. Yeah. So that was kind of the crux of it. You went from you know, you know, free living skier picking off peaks. You know, open up op- being the pioneer for the whole range, and then he comes along and it basically ruined your dream. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Real job. Yeah. Right. So how do you feel now about him stepping into that role and picking up where you left off? Are you, is it, are you like, you little bastard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just nice to see the technology and the progression in the sport, really. You know, when we were doing it, we were just climbing peaks and basically taking the most aesthetic big line. Right. And now, uh, you know, they're looking for the little skinny shoot with the freaking 60 foot air in the middle or whatever and something they can That's trick true. off of. Or before we just kind of, you know. Right, ski right. curry, ski the main line, and that was that was plenty, plenty enough. So that's kind of one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Is normally, I don't delve too much into like full on history stuff. I like knowing what's people going on, but I think this this new generation kind of needs to know a little bit more about you. It's like from I know, and you're probably squirming because you don't like talking about yourself. But like, how did you end up in Whistler in the first place? And this was back in like mid '80s, right? <clears throat> 
Yeah, it would have been mid early eighties. Yeah, when I first came down here, uh, I worked with a guy named Trevor Peterson. Mm-hmm. Ran into him at Apex Alpine. Became really good friends, and he told me about this place called Whistler. He grew up in West Van, and him and his brothers used to come up here skiing. On the weekends, or skip school and come up, and uh, he goes, yeah, you got to check this place out. So when it ended at Apex, we split our own ways. I went back up north logging. I grew up in northern BC around Mackenzie. My dad was a logger and uh, worked for him for a summer, and Trevor and Helly logging on the coast here. And we made a call. He called me. He goes, oh, I'm looking for work. It's pretty slow on the coast. Is there anything up north? And I go, oh, nothing really going on. It's the same thing up here. So we agreed to meet at Apex Alpine again for a race called Shoot to Shoot. Long story short, short, we met there, big piss up, went fast on skis, got in the back of a 65 Chevy car, ended up in Worcester with a backpack, three pairs of skis, 50 bucks in my pocket, and uh, yeah, the rest is history, yeah. Awesome. Kind of and did you funny. settle like right in Whistler? Was Pemberton even a thing then? Yeah, no, I didn't even know of Pemberton back then much, no. yeah, until a couple years later when we started fishing and coming out here fishing, but yeah. Get, get away from the big city of Whistler and like, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was probably only three or four <clears throat> or five years into when the village was built, right? Yeah, I think the village was like early, early 80s and I think I rolled in there in 83, so they were still kind of building stuff. What was the vibe like back then? I moved to Whistler in 99 and in the summertime, I used to tell people you could like roll a bowling ball down the center of the village stroll and you wouldn't hit anybody because it it was just winter and that's it. Was it like a ghost town then or was it still like, it was built as a tourist town? Yeah. But it was still fairly new? Was it busy? Yeah, it was built as a ski hill. Right. right? So when skiing ended... People went their separate ways. In those days, there wasn't a ton of work around Whistler. So, end of the ski season, we'd all go our separate directions. Trev would go logging on the coast. I'd go up north working. I'd go tree planting. And we'd all meet back there in October. Right. And, uh, yeah, play hockey sack in the village. <laughs> skate around. Wait for the mount to open. And then a couple of years later, jobs became a lot more available with the construction boom and building and right. cabins and houses. and. We're able to stay there year round. What was like the living, like the like the the accommodations and stuff? Now, like now, it's ridiculous. It's super expensive and it's hard to find a place. But back then, there probably wasn't many places to find, so it may have been even or no. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. You know, we paid usually around two hundred, two hundred and fifty bucks for a place. Uh, I think I had a girlfriend there for a bit, so our places were usually around four hundred and fifty bucks for one bedroom. Yeah, and back in those days, not a whole lot of girls around, right? So uh, right, yeah, so, you know, but now. Now they're probably paying, living in the same houses that you used to live in, but paying two grand. Yeah, way oh, more. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. the same shit the, boxes yeah. now. Right? They just throw a coat of paint on it. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, now yeah. this is fine. Um, so you basically come to Whistler and you'd, uh, you got your start, like you said you're from up north. Where you get, did you get your start skiing in like Terrace or like Smithers area or where, whereabouts? No, I was north of Prince George, a ski hill called Azu Ski Village, A-Z-U. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, now people might know it as Powder King. I was wondering yeah, about that, so yeah. It, uh, it evolved into Powder King. They put it in the chair, left another T-bar a little bit over from the old area. Were your parents big skiers? Like, how did you get into it? Yeah, you know, that's what we did on weekends. You either played hockey or went skiing, right? My parents bought a place up there thinking... 71 and uh yeah we'd all hop in the back of a truck or in the front seat used to put six of us in a regular cab skis in the back and maybe the neighbor kids in the back of the truck and about a 45 minute drive to the hill yeah spend the weekend up there and yeah come back on sunday night and you're hooked do do the same thing again next week absolutely absolutely hooked so i kind of want to stick around at the kind of the beginning of things so you got trevor who else is around in those days that you're like in your core crew uh there's quite a few guys uh eric crow which is still around today. Pro Magnum Man's his nickname. Yep. Yeah, Machine. Uh, Steve Smerge, rest his soul. Uh, those are kind of my main buddies. Uh, Sean Hughes, which is still around uh, today. Uh, yeah, there's a few other guys. But yeah, it was a pretty small crew, really, you know, of uh, guys that kind of wanted to get after it and right. kind of hike around and go touring. Because yeah. back then, there wasn't the infrastructure on the mountain. The mountains are great, but there's no peak chair at that point in time, I'm assuming, no. right? So you got to hike right so now we've got like, some questions i have for you about the, the gear and stuff back then is like now you get everything from the cast turning system which i think you use right mm-hmm. where you can use your own bindings or you've got you know tech bindings you even even bef- way bef- way after then it still was like day wreckers and whatever <laughs> like what were you using to get up there you weren't boot packing up these peaks were you yeah at the start we were but and then we went on to an emery binding mm-hmm. which is uh they didn't even sell them at mac or on the coast we got them out of Manoa sports in Alberta and got them shipped out here. So is it like a like a 
Like a locking tally binding? What, what was that? No, it was, a, it was a ski touring binding. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit old school, but yeah, it worked fine. Did the trick. A buddy of mine used to drill the holes out on the back and put a look 99 heel on it to get a little bit of a more solid heel on it. You know, they were, they were kind of plastic and uh, yeah, they broke every now and then. But what, what were the skins like? Was it like you go deer hunting in the, yeah, <laughs> in, in the say, fall yeah, and then you make sure yeah, you cut a strip long enough for you your know, two tens? You know, that's funny. They really haven't changed that much, really. You know, we, we had stick on skins back then. And prior to stick on, uh, there were guys that had uh, strap on. They used little leather straps that came over the top and you'd strap them on. But even when we were touring in the early 80s, we had uh, skins that you could actually glue on your ski so it wasn't too bad yeah. they were just they were just a little skinnier yeah right like so so that's what i wanted to talk to you about so i was watching so last night i was trying to i got a bunch of stuff i have to do at home like i should prepare a little bit for this thing and i started watching some old uh some old films it was it rap films i was checking out a couple little yeah. rap films and i was watching what was the one that i watched last night it was uh something with a really lame name Something back to the snow or something like that. The snow zone. Into, into the, the snow, snow zone, zone. yeah. yeah, yeah right. So I was, I was yeah. like, what, what a name. <laughs> into the snow zone. But I was watching you guys ski these just sick lines on these brutal skis. Well, are, well from what? Not brutal. It's probably the wrong term, but like from people like us. Yeah, yeah. Us youngsters that are so spoiled with the latest technology. The last 20 years, ski yeah. technology has gone <clears throat> complete like tech right computers yeah. and design and and like there's been a lot of money put into them so i'm watching you guys ski these lines so well yeah. just a little you know a little adjustment with how you take the turn lift that uphill a uphill leg yeah. and whatnot yeah. so how have you have you ever do you ever think about back in those days and like skiing a lot of these lines and these zones when you're on your new skis nowadays thinking like oh man if i had these what would it have been like then? Do you ever think about that? Like, yeah, you whippersnappers are so lucky with this. <laughs> uh, you know, Do you know I, what I'm trying I to get at? You don't think of that. No, no. it's just, you know, you're a product of environment you use, but you have, and that was it. You know, race technology was really the only technology back in the day. So you free skied on basically race skis right. or recreational. So skis how about or, now though, when you're skiing, you're like, oh, these are great. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little easier on the body. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, and it just, it makes it a little easier in varied conditions for sure. You can put on a pair of two by fours, a nice virgin pow and ski, but, uh, yeah, when it gets adverse, the new technology is pretty nice. Yeah, the little rocker on the tip and tail just to make things a bit easier for sure. Now, we're, we're, there wasn't as many differences back then, but when you had, you said you had three pairs of skis, threw them in the back of the truck, were they all the same? Whereas now there's a quiver. You've no. got like a park ski, you've got like a, you know, a short underfoot groomer ski, or you got a pow ski back there with like three of the exact same ones. <laughs> no, a little bit different. No, I think I had a pair of 204 slaloms, 205 GSs, and a pair of 225. <laughs> Red sled atomic downhill skis. Yeah. So what were your, my quiver? What were you? <laughs> what, what were your like your big mountain nar ski? What was it? Uh, probably a back in that day it would be a K two uh, slalom ski, mm -hmm. like a two o four. Yeah, yeah, kind of a nice forgiving ski. And if you if you skied it, put about two hundred days on it, it, used to soften up really nicely. I was going to ask you is it because it was a little bit <laughs> yeah, soft. Well, you threw it out and the foam started coming out of the sidewall of the core, right? Because <laughs> they didn't have the full cap yet. They had like the yeah, the sidewall ski, sidewall race ski. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you ever have to like fix them? Be like, ah, oh, these are busted. Would you just get a new pair or toss them, or were you at yeah, the stage no, then where you just have to fix them as much as you could, right? Yeah, it wasn't just get a new pair. <laughs> no money back in those days, right? Just right, speed what you had. And you right, them. you don't have a kid who's <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> who's all hooked up, ready to go. Yeah. Um, so I have a bunch of questions for for you about that stuff, and we'll get to you soon, Logan. Don't you worry. I know you're probably happy sitting there. I'm I'm chilling. Chilling. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So everybody knows that you're kind of one of the pioneers of free ride skiing, especially with opening up a lot of first descents, especially within the Whistler area. Yeah. Uh, everything from like Decker, Tremor, Wedge. Uh, you, what, you Mount Waddington, you were first descents? Yeah, it was kind of a heli assist thing. but whatever. Right. And, and I know you don't really care about, you know, tallying that stuff. Like you're yeah. not boastful. Like you just did it because you wanted to do it. But back then, w were you aware that, oh, this is the first descent. We're going to go ski this. Or were you like, we just want to ski this and it happens to be. Yeah, it started out like that. And then we started, you know, searching for, you know, bigger mm -hmm. first descents and looking at alpine journals and trying to find lines that guys climbed and said, you know, a nice 55 degree north facing 
thousand foot slope and we kind of look at that and mm -hmm. go, oh yeah, that, that looks pretty good. Right? Now, did the switch come when you started getting a little bit more attention and you're like, oh sweet, I don't actually have to, have to go up north and cut trees down this, this summer because I'm actually getting paid. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, it, it's definitely a motivating factor when you have sponsors and whatnot to, to push it a bit more. But, mm -hmm. you know, we used to get shit all the time for going and doing stuff without cameras or anything like that, just skiing a line and getting back and right. just people would hear word of mouth of it and our sponsors would tell us, oh, what's going on? You know, we should have been there writing a story and, you know, filming it. And we're going, yeah, whatever. Right. And what was that trend? So I do another podcast with Brett Tippy, and he was kind of the mirror image of what you guys are doing, but with the mountain bike scene. Right. And it was kind of the same, same, um, idea that he was saying is like, we just biked. We just, we wanted to go and do bike stuff. And then yeah. people started filming and we're like, okay, well, yeah. we can be involved in this. And then it kind of took over, so to speak. So did you get to a point where, you know, at least oh, whatever, that's fine. And then would you, I guess people would have to come to you and be like, Hey, what have you got planned? Or did you get to a stage where like, Hey, let's bring this guy along. Cause I don't know, knowing you, you'd probably just kind of want to do your thing. And then people like myself, yeah. We'd be like, hey, man, can I come to your house and yeah. <laughs> interview? Or, hey, can yeah. we tag along on this trip? And, like, what was that like? Yeah, I think when people started kind of realizing what we were getting into and doing, they started, you know, calling us and going, you know, hey, you want to come and film with us? Or, hey, you know, we want to go yeah. out on a trip with you and write a story or something like that. And I think that was probably the progression of that. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's pretty low budget. And yeah you know, right well a lot of money right right that's Just still having fun right that time of year yeah now do you logan when you have like trips and stuff like that when you guys are talking about those kind of trips does a lot of it kind of do you get a lot of those like kind of memories kind of pop back into your head and then do you see a lot of like how he's operating his ski career now with how you kind of got things started do you see a lot of similarities or do you find things that you're like hey that's interesting i did this once and like you know what I mean? Is it a kind of a, maybe a, maybe what I'm trying to say is kind of a bonding thing for you guys where you can like share these stories? I would say if I was more of like a mountaineer climber skier, I don't really have any interest in climbing that much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. earn your yeah. turn line. I don't know. I like efficiency, you know, sleds, <laughs> helicopters, helicopters and sleds. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you still got to boot up, boot up yeah, stuff yeah. and stomp up stuff to ski it. Right? But I bet if like I was like going up to whatever i don't know even yeah. ski on denali or something or wherever i was skiing the lines that you used to ski we'd talk about it more yeah but it's just a different kind of game for me compared to what he was doing mm -hmm. maybe because we didn't have the budget and the way we could do it was to stop yeah, up yeah. It or, or go go get after it on our feet right we didn't have the budget for the helis and this and that right right until we got into filming with rap and next thing you know we're in alaska and we've got endless heli budget and right ski planes and yeah it kind of changed the game a little bit there for sure yeah. yeah did he get did you get your love of of uh motors and engines because of because of this guy i'm assuming i mean i don't know <laughs> it's, hard, I just, it's hard to say i no, just right? work on it because they're look cheaper at this, look, than look at, hiring people. look at this shop right you've got a couple rally cars out in the out in the yard i think is that other rally cars yeah one's just yes. full stage rally car yeah full stage rally car you got yeah. a jet boat and you got a couple sleds kicking around i'm sure that's kind of where the influence came from. Were you? Did you get to a point where you're like, I'm sick and tired of climbing this shit. I want to get out of there quick and easy <laughs> oh, myself. For sure. Oh, for sure. But back to the point about Logan working on stuff and becoming pretty efficient at building stuff. I think it just becomes a product of his environment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if you got to pay somebody to do it, well, guess what? Well, maybe you, you got to spend your money, make money work, and to pay for somebody to do that rather than go out skiing and sled. Right. Or if you work on it yourself at night make it more affordable and it gives you more time to play and more money. Right. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, you know, the bottom line there. Right. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. it's a good work ethic too. Like I know you got him logging <clears throat> when he was in his early twenties. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't want to work like on rusted out engines and whatever <laughs> trucks. Like if I could afford it, I'd hire somebody. You know? No problem. Just don't, I don't, I don't love just don't tell him stuff. about it. Just make sure you get it fixed yeah. and then <laughs> never tell him there's a problem. Are you the kind of guy that's like, hey, bring it into the shop? Or you're like, all right, there's space in the shop. Go fix it yourself. Yeah, a little bit of both, you know. There's, mm -hmm. You know, I'm busy in the summer, so he bought a jet boat earlier this summer. And we sold one and bought one. And I told him, hey, I'm not a shop guy in the summer. I put my head down and I do the jet boat thing, ride my bike. And right, right. Play a little golf and that's it. So he put his head down here. And I can see when I'd come into the shop, he'd be like, oh, yeah. Thanks for the help. And I just turn around. Oh, it looks good, Logan. Yeah. looks good. You're doing a good job there. Good. When you guys do have that time, do you find that's kind of like your good like father-son bonding time to get a little, you know, sappy? 
sort of thing. Here? Yeah, because you know what? Even though maybe you guys are you know trying to solve a problem and it's a pain in the ass and it's twelve at night and you guys are pissed off with each other, it's still you look back on those moments and you're like, actually, that was kind of fun. I mean, I, I don't know. Not never any twelve <laughs> at night problems. Really. No, no, no. We're not he's trying not to work at twelve at night, but uh, you know what I'm talking uh, about, though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty good. Yeah, we, I think we each know our place now, mm-hmm. right? When we first started building our first jet boat together, we were kind of bumping heads a bit. But about a week into it, we kind of realized each other's strengths and weaknesses, I think. And uh, yeah, well, one guy had an idea, you just roll with it and, you know, you discuss a few things. And right. One guy would be better at welding this, the other guy would be better at fabricating this. So you just kind of learned your strengths and weaknesses and you went with it. And like I said, the first couple of weeks, we probably bumped heads quite a bit and then we just kind of, okay. Yeah, you got this figured out. This family, right? Like you I can know. go home at five. I'll drink beer for two hours, clean the shop, get it. We're all ready yeah, to go yeah, in yeah. the morning. You yeah. show up at eight. I'd have maybe a fire going here, and I'd roll in here at nine, and yeah, you know, you need that little break a bit yeah. too, right? Like same thing with right. with family, like my family, my brother, my dad, anybody. Within five minutes, you know exactly what buttons to push. You know exactly what buttons get pushed. Right, so you can easily set each other off depending on what the mood you are. You know where you guys are at, so it's nice to be able to yeah, like yeah. manage that and be like, "All right, it's time to go home." Yeah, <laughs> you beat it. I'm gonna chill yeah. for a bit. I mean, I don't have much say. It's all this is his house, his yeah, his shop. So I... There was a few Orange County moments here for sure. Eh? Orange County <laughs> oh, the, the choppers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Dad yelling, son yelling. Oh, for sure. It's you know that's part of the game, right? Part of the game is solving problems and then. Figured out getting along in the long run, but yeah, right. of course you bump heads, right? So inevitable that, father and son working together. Absolutely. So <laughs> being on the same topic of you guys working together, do you guys? I know you every once in a while you'll get out for a mission, like a like a curry. You were talking about curry central shoot last time or a pencil yeah. shoot. Do you guys still make sure that you guys get out on some kind of a mission every year? Yeah. 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 Sledding usually now. Yeah, more sledding. Or yeah, we'll hook up on the mountain every now and then, but easy. Yeah, we'll go out sledding. I'll maybe help out with safety if he's on a program. Right. I'll go yeah, there and run a bit of safety and, you know, I'll just keep an eye on things. Just sit back and just... Yeah. Just kind of hang out, right? Yeah, exactly. Because it's, yeah. it's good because you're the dad that everybody knows is Eric Peota. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they're not going to say no to you, but you're also not the guy that's going to step into the limelight. You're not there to take, you know, any attention away from no, him. No, no. But you're still, you know, you're the hockey dad that's actually just up there watching rather than screaming and yelling at the yeah. ref, you know? Yeah, true. Helping cameramen get unstuck on their sleds. Yeah. And, uh, you know. It's... Yeah, right? And then they're like, oh, my God. That, they go home and they're like, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. Like, why well, I <laughs> crashed and I got stuck and I, Eric Peota had to dig me out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's it's a lot. That's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because you felt like it's a thing. (laughs) Is that why you forced yourself so hard? So you don't have to end up (laughs) stuck. All right. So (laughs) going to turn attention on to you a little bit. So last time you were on the show, you were still competing for your ride world tour. I think you were just on your way to Austria. You ended up, I think, winning that event. The one before, I think that was 2017. Uh, You were filming Numinous. Um, but you were talking about wanting to do a backflip on the sled. That was mm-hmm. about that was about that five. Was what we were talking about that was about five years ago, and I remember I, that's. So I do so many of these that I don't remember a lot of what all the conversations are. Yeah, it's almost like sense. I have them and I forget them. Yeah. But that's one of the things I remembered because I was like, well, this crazy man wants to do a backflip on his sled." Twenty seventeen. I, I think that was like the first year I got a sled too. Something like that. Oh, You're, second. That was my second sled. Right. Maybe. And you were like, I think I'm a few years away. I think I'm a few years away. So I always had that in my mind. And then what was it a couple years ago? Yeah. You started really well, trying. Yeah. Then every, yeah, that was crazy. It was like sliding. It was like, nobody was doing like backcountry flips. And then just like, in like, yeah, a Boom. couple of years, everybody. I was yeah. like, cause you had mentioned that on the show too. I think it's episode 83 for those of you that want to go back and have a listen. What are you at now? <sighs> To 15 or shit. something, I think. This will be the first episode of <clears throat> season 10. Season 10. 10 years. Well, yeah, yeah, 10 years of podcast. Who would have thought? Not me. <laughs> um, but you were talking about like, oh, you said the same thing. I'm surprised no one's really doing it. And this is kind of what I'm, I want to do. We were talking yeah, about yeah. like, can you do it on a bike? And you're like into foam. I never did do it on the bike. You didn't do it on the bike? No, no, I just... Yeah, just try them on the slides, and I don't know. Foam pit it would be down. nice to do it into a foam pit. <laughs> the foam, no, it was uh, it got, the foam pit was a it got oh in lot eight. Yeah, it uh, collapsed because oh, of the collapse. snow. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. 
But anyway, so uh, yeah. you did it. So there was a couple of years there where you were really pushing on it. And you told me, like, I have a goals list written down. And you opened your phone. It was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, maybe. I don't even remember that long ago. You're, you're like, it's the only one. I was making fun of him. Like, it's my only goal. I was addicted to sledding back then. I mean, I still am. So what was the process like through that now? Like, tell me, walk me through that. I mean, just getting comfortable on, on the sled, putting in the seat time. You know, i have still like, I mean, yeah, just got to. And then it just gets to a point where you just have to send it, kind of. You were there for my first attempt, yeah. say, or didn't. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot now since then. Like, yeah. you know, I would have done it on a different jump. Wouldn't even gone so big. Like, you don't even need that much air to do them if yeah. you got the right jump. But, uh, yeah, I think I got a shot of him on his, one of his first attempts. He's like freaking 30 feet in the fucking air, right? <laughs> it's like, you each the whole shit, man. <laughs> on the flat, too, right? It's like this yeah, full sketch. Well, I think that's kind of like what separates, like, you know, guys like yourselves from a lot of other people, right? Like for myself, I'm not going to do, if I'm going to go throw a backflip or something along those lines, I'm not going 30 feet in the air. And, and I've, I've thought about this a lot is like, I think that's what really separates a lot of people that have hats, like the one you're wearing and the people that get to where they are, whatever, whatever industry they're, they're skateboarding or they're snowboarding or they're skiing, mountain biking, whatever. You watch dudes that just send and it's almost as if they don't have any regard for their own health and safety. But that's coming from my point of view, my thought, like that's insane, right? Whereas people that are at that level have the ability to gauge and to calculate, oh, I can actually do this. I can be 40, 50 feet in the air, but I understand what the impact's going to be. I understand how my body's going to handle it. I understand what the equipment is going to be like. And I think that's that one of the key points that separates the best from the rest yeah i mean i think it's just getting comfortable like you know you're comfortable here and then you know say like me and my kind of my peers are here and so yeah, our uncomfortable like said, level is like yeah your comfort level that's what separates yours, right you know? it separates and, the best and, rest. and you become a product of your environment too right? right you just don't go sledding and throw a 30 foot backflip you know you <laughs> You know, you you you're on your sled, like you say. You have a passion for it. You get addicted to it, and you just want to keep pushing the level, and it just keeps going up. And yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people don't ever get to that level or, or understand it, and they think it's reckless. And you know, a lot of people I know, and Logan was, you know, I think he flipped over a train one time, and yeah, right there, There's yeah, a photo yeah. on the wall, yeah, yeah, I took that. yeah, a lot of shitty comments. You know, it's so dangerous. You know, you're gonna kill. You know, but. Those are the people that they did someone understand. Like you said, it's, yeah. it's that understanding of, of your abilities of, it's like your own unique personal physics. It's so, it's yeah. so interesting to, to, to gauge, like I said, I've been, and then like for yourself, I'm sure you had the same kind of people commenting on you guys when you were skiing like a line on Decker or something. They're like, Oh my God, that's so extreme. But now it's basically lift access. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. With like the, the, all the, you know, progression and that sort of thing. So I actually had a funny thought with, uh, maybe you can touch on this. So we talked about the progression of like the, the technology of skis, everything from lifts to all that kind of stuff. And we're getting to a point now we've had the discussion specifically with like slope style and stuff like spin to win, like how many mm-hmm. spins can you actually do? Or are they going to eventually start taking off and like, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, getting yeah. lift, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when it gets to a certain point of progression, when is regression progression? Do you think there's going to be a time when people are pulling out two, 204 slalom skis to start yeah, doing that start stuff? Challenging right? themselves? It, exactly, because the guys are doing what they're doing now on the technology now, yeah. right? You opened up that, that whole realm on those skis, and then they pushed it as technology increases, they push it, push the limits. So once they get to a certain level, do you think guys like yourself are going to start going back to this old technology to see, hey, can I actually cut it? I mean, yeah, it's scary for the knees. <laughs> but Certainly uh, not me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. another lifetime, but right. Because yeah. I like I like watch a lot of baseball and like a lot, a lot of sports and stuff. And you look at the different eras, right? You look at like basketball in the '60s with a bunch of white dudes, and then you look at basketball now, and it's like, oh, we're comparing stats. I'm like, like Will Chamberlain, the one, the one black. Dude, the tallest dude in a <laughs> sea of, you know, white basketball players who just went and absolutely dominated, right? So hundred points in one game, if I uh, hundred point, correctly. yeah, exactly, hundred points in one game, yeah. right? So, but that's I think a product of kind of the people that he was playing with at that yeah. point in time. Versus now, mm-hmm. it's you'll never see a hundred points in a in a game again. I think the closest was I'm not even a basketball fan. I just 
like stats. It was yeah, like Kobe, who got like eighty, right? So the, there's a lot more parity, yeah. right? Yeah, I, know. I mean, so the question would be, would be like, can you know the 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 pinnacle of skiing now? Would they be in that same position, and would it be comparable to back in the day when guys like yourself were were leading the charge on that same equipment? I don't know. That was a long, long-winded question, but I think <laughs> yeah, you'd be yeah. we going to go back. I'm a little long-winded, but I I'm just saying this, it's, it's interesting for me to think about. Yeah. Are you going to throw on a pair of 215s? I think it'd be interesting, for sure. Yeah. That's funny you say that. It's only but. if everybody shoots uh, film again, right? Yeah, digital. The 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 helmet, the cam- the helmet camera, yeah, yeah. like the yeah, actual big he- on the side, right? Did you ever have to wear that thing? No, I never did. No, no, no. I think Stumpy brought that out, and I think it was Plake and uh, High Trip and those guys. Yeah, Tippy Tippy wore it a few times. Oh, he did, he did. tell me about it. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. It was a like a little Super Eight duct tape to the side. You of could hear it going yeah. like in the in the yeah, ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so back to you. So uh, I can't get away. I'll, I'll get vilified if I don't ask you. And every what two or three years that photo of you and trevor riding the skids of that helicopter yeah. pop up can you please tell me the story of that um yeah the story is pretty straightforward uh it's a kind of underpowered 206 with these big water pontoons on it so for them to land on sketchy peaks and situations and you're inside to get out and get your skis you're there for a lot longer period of time we thought it was a good idea just to hop on the pontoon sit on our skis and hang on and then when he towed into something, we both get off at the same time. We, we thought it was more efficient. Okay, now this is before I was a pilot and I knew about downwinds and downdrafts, right? Right. So I started flying planes shortly after this and I, I hit some bad downdrafts with my seatbelt tightened up as much as it was a goal. My head would still hit the ceiling, right? So we were riding this helicopter with no harnesses or anything. We're just hanging on. So... I think back, well, geez, if there was a bad downdraft, there's no way you're hanging on. <laughs> you're going right through the road. You guys are getting yeah. down. But, you know, ignorance is bliss, right? I, right? I didn't think about it at that time. We thought it was more efficient, and, and, it, and it worked out to be pretty efficient. We were able to do some really neat toe wins on some pretty rad peaks that probably we wouldn't have been able to do yeah. in that low-powered helicopter by coming there, him having to land, opening doors, getting out, this and that, where it was just in, off, helicopter's gone. So, so it wasn't, it, was it, it, it wasn't like a stunt, a bravado, a bravado stunt, maybe no, a little no, bit, but it was more no, like, no, let's, no, let's no. get the job done quicker. No, efficiency for sure. Yeah. Just thought it was uh, safer. We thought it was safer. Honestly, at the time. Really? We thought it was safer. So no harnesses, nothing yet. No. Was there like a handle at least to hold well, the to? Well, the crossbar with the pontoon attached to that was it. Yeah. You just straddle it. <laughs> okay. Sat on your skis in your poles. Right? Yeah. And then, yeah. So, so who of, came up with the, that idea? I don't know. I can't remember. I, mean, I think it was me or Trev, one of the two. It was just two of us doing it. Right? You just sit and having beers one day after a, a day on the hill. Yes. And you're like, why don't we... What, what was that? It was It was probably something to the effect that... Yeah. That's the mummager, by the way. That's yeah. Mom, mom just walked in. Parvin, yeah. you want to come join us? <laughs> <laughs> no. What was that, Parvin? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, back to the helicopter. Yeah. I, I don't know if we're sitting over beers. It was probably just spur of the moment on the mountain we wanted to land there and he goes no i, I can't get in there because of the winds right you know i can't hover there and we said well how about if we just ride on here i think that's how it actually became and we did it for that entire trip what do you do like, there was more than just one ride hey far if you want to come over here you can <laughs> come on over oh you got my favorite beer <laughs> <laughs> So like, yeah. what it, did you guys do a test run? Like, let's let's hop on and hover <laughs> around the parking lot or come, or you're just like, oh, it'll be fine. No, no, She'll be all right. I, I just think you hopped on and went. Yeah, I don't remember practicing and going up and down in the parking lot. No, we just so, rode skiing and uh, skied right. a line and went. We want to land there, and he goes, oh, it's kind of windy. I don't want to hover there. And I think we just said, well, how about if we ride like this and get off real quick. And then who do you know who took the picture? Yeah, it was Mark Gallup. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then, so obviously you're just doing this and then that photo comes out. I'm yeah. sure, it, was it Powder Magazine that it went into or where? Probably Powder, but in in that day he had to uh, Photoshop, well, Photoshop probably with a paintbrush, <laughs> uh, the call signs out on the side of the heli. So. so Oh, so you wouldn't get, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Little Good call. Because yeah. that, that's my next question. Did you guys get a lot of blowback or did you get in trouble for yeah, that? Yeah, maybe 10 years later, but it was too late by then, right? Yeah, exactly. right. right. Well, it's, yeah, it's uh, it's like what's happening now. It's like people are getting canceled for stuff they said 10 years ago in a different time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You guys yeah, were yeah. you guys were doing what? Yeah. Can't do anything nowadays. 
It's a podcast. That's one of the one of the <laughs> sketchiest things you could possibly do these days. You think doing a backflip on a <laughs> on a snowmobile is is sketchy? Try having a podcast and making sure that you remember everything you said, and not saying yeah, something enough. stupid in the spur of the moment after having like a beer or two. Do you know what I mean? That's a cool photo, though. If like if people look at that photo, you can see their tracks behind them. Um, right. Some people probably gotcha. don't know that. It's but. a pretty cool line too, because it was a, a big serac that came down and was covered with snow and it was like this big hanging ice fall and uh i haven't been back there in quite a few years but somebody told me that that no longer exists that tongue just broke away right just mm -hmm. yeah melted away and broke away so do you have a do you have that like in the house anywhere picture the yeah picture i think it's upstairs on the wall and mm -hmm. yeah yeah so when you were a kid growing up looking at that thing you know were you just like oh yeah that's cool do you remember ever having a moment where you're like wait a minute that's nuts uh yeah i don't know i think if you just see it every day it's like oh that's normal right that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and then it's like oh i hope i can do that one day but now you can't you can't just i mean you could just don't take the photo yeah exactly. I, no yeah, exactly. i have the pilots yeah. The, yeah. i've tried <laughs> <laughs> for real yeah, 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 sure, yeah. my dad did it yeah, yeah exactly if yeah. you had the opportunity to recreate that would you oh for sure why not yeah i'd probably do it a little differently right maybe a hard point and you know the harness and a in a handle yeah maybe you know buckle in so the downdraft doesn't send you through the rotors <laughs> do you still do you still think you have that uh adventurous bone in you oh i think so yeah you know maybe it's changed to different things like rally cars and jet boats but you know i still love skiing i, I think i got my 73 days in last year oh yeah i saw it on the hill a couple times are you mostly mostly backcountry now though? no no i love on mountain skiing yeah i love lift skiing i love going up and down i love mm -hmm. going fast yeah, like, right. I like when it's hard snow sometimes. The right? groomer days are fun sometimes. Yeah. Just because sometimes it's just nice to five or six laps and just get some turns, have your leg burn, and then you're out of there. Ski over 100 kilometers an hour standing up. You know, it's what, what a blast on a couple of sticks, right? Right. Not too many sports you could do that. You, ha you had the racing mean. skis, but did you ever actually do much racing? Yeah, I did when I came here. I got into racing a little bit, you know, because we really didn't have it where I grew up. There wasn't really a such thing as grooming, right? Corduroy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, kind of to put it in context where I grew up is still considered cat skiing with a lift. Right. Right. It's a lot of soft snow up there. So we didn't really have this hard, firm corduroy snow. When I came here, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. This is different. So I did. I got into it for a few years. And actually, I excelled. Did really well on it. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of something I did. And then I kind of, you know, was too old to really go for all cup or right. race anything like that. So it's just got into the back country. Just do stuff like the Black Home, 1991 Black Home Extreme Championships. Yeah, exactly. Have yeah, you seen yeah. those videos? Yeah, that's an epic video. <laughs> yeah, I love how uh, that was like Doug Coombs and like yourself and there's a handful yeah, of other sure. dudes and they're all just shit talking Dean in God the face. Because yeah, yeah. it was that's on the Sudan yeah. Kuar right, yeah. Extreme, whatever it's called and you guys are all just like, oh, this isn't extreme. This is <laughs> this is like lift access. I kind of thought it was funny like watching you guys just, you know, yeah, this isn't Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> that I, I, I love that. I had to do it. Did you? I had no money. I was supposed to be on a climbing trip in Rainier on the East Ridge, going mm -hmm. for the first uh, ascent. No, not first ascent, the first ski descent of the East Ridge of uh, Mount Rainier. But I had no money. So you so, wanted to enter this uh, competition? Stumpy says I'll give you three hundred bucks if you go in this competition. I go, yeah, oh, man. Oh, for real? Oh, so you yeah, were paid yeah. to go in it, and then yeah, there was yeah, a, yeah, there's a prize, bucks. wasn't there as well? Twenty five hundred bucks, yeah. Oh yeah, did you win? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Had a big party, spent half of it all my buddies, and then <laughs> and then you go to Rainier the next year. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, I actually never did go back to Rainier, but yeah, whatever. No, how many whatever. how many first ascents do you figure you have? Oh, three or four. That's it? No, thousands. Yeah, no, not thousands, but ah, uh, you know, there's lots. You know, if you count them, like guys count them today, you know, hundreds, but. You know, if I if I just count the big peaks and the main lines and whatnot, right. you know, twenty five fifty type type thing. But you know, there's you know, you look at some people, they'll you know, there's ten first descents on you know one little peak, right? But right. Mm -hmm. our first descents were just the main aesthetic north north face northeast. Right. Your first descents was the mountain, and then people have to come in and start picking lines. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. You know, we weren't necessarily looking for the raddest line; we were looking for the most aesthetic, most beautiful, good snow. Some, kind of something to yeah. ski and it wasn't yeah, necessarily to take a photo or anything it was just no, like this is going to be yeah. a great line and yeah, a good adventure bet. for the day right you betcha and then hopefully there's a drainage where we can get back to the village and hit cheetahs yeah, up exactly. for a beer in the afternoon right yeah, yeah. and now it's like i have to like look at like what's the sketchiest <laughs> gnarliest <laughs> line yeah. with the biggest cliff on this face 
Yeah, to make it a first. <laughs> yeah, or just to be cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah cool yeah. in the ski world. Yeah, like as deep as as possible. Like you know, they're like, oh, this zone is. Uh, you gotta go. Yeah. You gotta enter this wormhole, and it yeah, brings yeah. you out into this other part of the universe, and like it hasn't been untouched. How many do you figure you have? <clears throat> first descents. I don't know. None. No, no, I'm sure. <laughs> first, first lines. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure first lines. Would. Yeah, sure but like would. not like. I'm not climbing mountains. No, no. First, you established that. Or, you, just, you, esta- <laughs> you established that already for sure, right? But definitely skewed first lines, I guess, on faces. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, lots. So, what do you got planned for this for this season coming up? Um, just filming again this year. Yeah. No, no competitions this year. Are you gonna if you get a wild just card? Filming. Are you gonna go in a, in a wild card? <laughs> by the time I by the time this so. by the time this is out, <laughs> yeah. the schedule's been released. Yeah. No. No, I think we're just gonna do strictly filming. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, even, not even you got a wild card for gold yeah no I, already, I think I already said no to that <laughs> it's, it's hard to beat 98 out of 100 <laughs> yeah exactly that was the first ascent on that yeah. face yeah it was <laughs> ridiculous absolutely ridiculous and then the next day that you hit that other massive line that you just just missed yeah yeah that would have been a double header that was close so I don't know I don't think I talked to you about this on the, on the show but like for those lines, like you, when you were competing, you would choose lines that nobody else saw because back to what we were talking about is like, there's that comfort level. There's the best mm-hmm. and then there's the rest, but then there's the best and then there's like the best plus, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you're competing yeah. in the free eye world tour and you skied two days back to back, just sent two of the biggest gnarliest things I've ever seen with my own eyes that no one else even considered that we're already on the tour. And they're like, where's he going? Like, where's he go? Where? Oh my God. Oh my God. Right. So do you, but that's for competition. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be doing that for fun. It's, that's well, that's risky. That, that's, <laughs> well, that's the question, right? Well, I've seen, I've seen a lot of your footage, right? And I do see that you pick lines that a lot of people wouldn't even think about. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to those competitions, I started doing it. I did it like three years, like all of them in a row. And I just, like I didn't want to ski the same line right. over and over. So I just like would want to change it up and be like, Oh, I haven't skied it that way. And, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, if you want to stick out, you got to do something different. Mm-hmm. Is that how you approach your film career too? You got to do something a little different. You're going to stick yeah, out the wow factor. Yeah. The shock factor. You know, that's what the people like to see. You don't want to be the same as everybody else. You got to try and do something different. Right. So do you have like objectives in mind for like this season coming up? Like, are you have, like, have you seen your, your, uh, segments that are coming out this fall? I haven't seen like the edited segment, but you know, what's I in know it. every, you skied it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you I know were, what's going to be in it. You're like, I was there. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so do you have like, do you keep that in mind? And then maybe based on how they're edited and how they're put together, do you take that and use that as kind of fuel for next season? Uh, yeah, more like just learning, like, you know, I just watch, you know, watch other guys too. It kind of teaches you like, oh, that's kind of a way to hit a feature. Because when I first started filming, I hadn't, I'd never really watched that many ski movies growing up. Like, I probably watched all yours when I was younger, but maybe, after that. Not. Dad gets the kids into the room, hey boys, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> no, we do, yeah, we didn't but, really watch that many ski movies. Right? Yeah. yeah, so when I first started filming i just was kind of skiing like i did on the competition scene now it's like i look at features a lot different you know you can kind of just dissect a face and you're like okay i'm just gonna hit this one feature because i know it's gonna be like right, a shot right. for a movie as opposed to competition sending like, something massive and impressive but doesn't yeah. necessarily because it's over, yeah, exactly. over in five seconds versus yeah. you can ski a line at this like like, like abma it's the reason he's in his 40s and he's still yeah, at the top of his it. game, right? Skiing amazing lines, making it look good. Yeah, in good conditions. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Who, who, who would be kind of your... Who are the people that you look to? Like, styles that you like? People that you look to that you maybe in the past have wanted to emulate your skiing after? Or people that you're, like, really keen on, on checking out these days? Like, who do you like watching? Um, before, it was, like, the big mountain stuff, you know? Like, Hugo Harrison. You know, just hard charging. Mm-hmm. But now, obviously, everything's kind of evolving and progressing, and now it's more kind of like the tricks and stuff. So I just watch my peers, you know, like Sam Koosh, Skier Cole, Lucas Walks, those guys, you know. Do you, do you, like, is there like a, 
like a fun rivalry. Not maybe rivalry is a bit harsh, but you know what I'm talking about. Like, oh my god, look what that guy did. Let's see what I can pull off. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what I'd say. Like when I watch their stuff, I'm like, oh, I should try and find a feature like that next year and do that mm-hmm. stuff like that. When you were coming up, did you have like a rival or anybody that you or maybe maybe not a rival, but someone that you were like, oh wow, I like that how that guy skis and like you know? Yeah, maybe some of the European. Uh, extreme skiers you know patrick ballas and things like that you know they weren't really throwing tricks at all right it's a totally different world we were just trying to ski rad lines and big mountains right so it's a mm-hmm. bit different back then but yeah patrick ballas i think was one of my kind of idols as a kid yeah 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 did you ever get to ski with him no never did no. is he a year old guy yeah yeah from <clears throat> sham yeah so when yeah. you guys are like in events and stuff together now do you find that a lot of dudes will still come up and be like dude man you shape my whole life when it comes to skiing, that sort of thing. Do you still get a lot of that? Yeah, most of those guys are dead now, though. They're old. <laughs> no, they, no, they come up to me. That's what the guys come up to me at the ski movies. Like, I watch your dad my entire life. That happens all the time. Right? So they come to you and ask, can you introduce me to your <laughs> yeah, dad, yeah, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah I'd be I like, it. you know, I have to come here to Pemberton, <laughs> yeah. go through the gate, and yeah. Yeah. fend off the dog. What do you think <laughs> I'm doing here? Fend off the dog. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm doing gate. it right now. It's not easy. So I know that a lot of, so uh, we, we recently were at a, a funeral service for a friend of both of ours, yeah. rest in peace, Toby, um, who, you know, got out there, he's the same kind of diet, wants to get out, sled and have a good time. But we were at the, at the, the service and we were hanging out at, at the end of the night, there's like what half a dozen of us, we were around the French connection, the yeah, French right. guys yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, having some beers and you were telling stories and I was sitting there kind of, you know, just taking in the moment, but just observing, I'm like. You're just telling these amazing stories and they're just feeding off. They're like, I love this. This is so great. Do you find like, I know that you're kind of maybe not shy, but you, you don't like to push yourself out there. But when people are engaged, do you really enjoy the storytelling and kind of rehashing like that kind of stuff? Yeah, I do to people that kind of understand. Like, you know, mm-hmm. this friend, she's that skied this line. Right. It's called the uh, Siberian Express on Atwell. And we skied the line called the Armenian Express, which is way narrower and way steeper, way rather. And they were talking about this line. And I just, well, yeah, I think I skied up there one time. We skied this line here. And they well, they had their picture on their phone. They brought it up. And they're, they're bringing it in. Oh, how did you get to this section? Yeah, 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 there. yeah. It looks very, ah, you know. We skied, took our time, you know. We didn't have to repel. But we had to jump a little bit. And yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's fun to tell people that kind of understand. Mm-hmm. I find I, uh, I story tell better with folks like that rather people, than people, people get it, that right. don't really. You, you'd rather, you'd rather like, like you said, kind of peers, right? People that kind of mm-hmm. understand, they yeah, get yeah, it exactly. rather than, you know, be on stage yeah, exactly. and, and, and kind of put it like that. Yeah. Some people like that ask me too. They're like, well, yeah, that guy on the show, but he's, I've had some, not yourselves, but like someone's like, yeah, that, yeah, that guy on the show and he's always such a good storyteller. I'm like, there's this different dynamic, right? When you're like on stage or like there's a microphone mm-hmm. in your face. It's kind of hard to kind of really get into that vibe. You know what I mean? That sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. I see what you're saying. Right, right. So like you said, when you're in that environment, you're in that yeah, you're spot, having a few beers. And you're talking to Blazer, talking to Coach Miller, a little C, right? Yeah. Got to give those guys a shout out. Yeah. Right? And <laughs> those, guys, those guys send it. <laughs> oh, absolutely, right? The whole French connection with Hugo, too. He's like a neighbor of yours. Those yeah, are in the corner. Yeah, still there, yeah. Right? So who are you skiing with these days? Like, just... Well, just that Logan and Dalton when they're in town. And yeah, I Logan Dalton. On the hill. Yeah, if yeah. He's on the hill. I'm usually on the hill. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's decent. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty good. I ski with my wife quite a bit. We mm-hmm. work together, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll have a couple runs, and we have a good communication. Well, I might ski something different. She'll ski around, and we meet at a lift, and bring our lunch up. We hang out in the sunshine, have some oysters, some crackers. There you go. Cheese. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Little day day. Yeah. Toby was a good partner when he uh, his kids started to get a bit older, and I, I kind of. Was expecting that uh, transition when Toby's kids got older, he'd be spending more time on the hill with them, right? Right, right. But when his kids were younger, and you know, we, we spent quite a bit of time skiing together. Eric Crow is another really good partner of mine. Right, right. Yeah, I know Toby telling me because I was painting for him off and on for years, right? And he'd be like, "Oh, I went with Peyota to the thing." I'm like, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> Back to then when you were kind of that, that still to me that legend, right? Yeah. Which you are to a lot of people, yeah. so I get it. I was like, "Oh, neat! What was that all about?" Yeah. And then you tell some ridiculous story about how you bailed him out or something like that, oh, or, yeah. or, or vice versa. <laughs> vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. We went, uh, we went. I think I tell you that we went uh, helping him cut wood. 
for his we went out to the lot he's like i came up to the job site one day and had a, my my pickup full of like uh rounds from a tree outside of my dad's house in the city and i was like oh. and so leaf spring yeah before the leaf spring <laughs> broke yeah yeah so i had all these all these rounds in the back he's like what are you doing with that wood i'm like oh, i'm just gonna split it and maybe sell it he's like well if you want to help me out I, i'm gonna go be doing a bunch of wood missions how about this you come out with me you help me whatever you put in your truck you keep whatever i have in my truck i just I keep put it from my house and we'll split it in the yard. I'm like, done. So I go every couple of weekends, we'd go out and uh, we came across this one spot and he found this really nice birch log. Yeah. And he's like, oh man, I got to tell Peyote about this one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you talking? He's like, well, he's like, well, the cedar doesn't, you want, you don't want to burn this one. This is wood's better than this one. And he was telling me that you're kind of filling him in oh, yeah, as yeah. you were doing. And he's like, oh, I got to show him this. I got to show him this. He's like, hey, check this out. I got this awesome birch log. <laughs> and he like, took a bunch of photos and was like, like it was like yeah. the golden, yeah. the golden goose he yeah, found he, on the middle of the He sent me photos of that all the time. And then one time, it's hemlock. It's not fur, Toby. That's hemlock. <laughs> it's all right, but it all burns. But uh, as you see around here, that's our main source of wood heat in the shop is uh, airtight. And then uh, in our house is also wood. So, right. Yeah, I kind of love wood. I don't know if you look around here, there's a sawmill up back and a ton of logs and everything, right. everything built around here. So, it's from the logging background. Yeah, right? you're, you're a logger, right? Yeah, it, just, it just makes sense. And it's, yeah. it's a good way of getting outside. Yeah. It's free heat, right? You just find a little. Well, Nothing's for free, but yeah. A little labor. Yeah, a little labor. A little, yeah. little sweat. You <laughs> look yeah, at yeah. him. Is that what I Brent, love firewood. Is that, <laughs> is that what... That's his worst hate. I made him get a load with me last week. He was all right. Is that what rent is for you here? Shop shop yes, time? That's what I told him. That's, that's what they said. You want to work in the shop, you got to come out and help get firewood. <laughs> I got the firewood. He did, yeah. Two loads of us. Yeah, that's that's too funny. And then, so does that mean getting it and then splitting and then stacking? I, yeah, I usually don't do the stacking. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. a thing. You're a good boy, Logan. <laughs> <laughs> that's his. So I want to I want to ask a couple more questions. We got I don't know a little bit of time left. I want you to see if you can. I know, like I said, it's it's hard to come up with stories, but I want to see if there's like a specific story that you can remember, like a maybe something around like opening up a peak around the Whistler area. Like I said, you're you're so now people go up Whistler, they hit up the 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 T bar that's a little little mission and then boom you're on Decker, right? You opened up Decker, you opened up all these little zones in here. Do you have a specific story that maybe sticks out in your mind or something that was maybe a little easier or a little more of a struggle than you can think about? I know it's kind of hard to to isolate one. I don't know. I just remember I was like when I was growing up, I'd be like, oh, I wonder if somebody skied this before. It's like. Yeah, somebody has like anything on Mr. Blackham. I think it would have been cool back in the day skiing something on the resort, mm -hmm. like for a first descent line. Yeah. What was your opinion when they put the peak in, peak chair in? Yeah, stoked, yeah. Stoked. Were you actually, oh, yeah? I didn't care. Because I heard some people, like for myself, yeah. like I heard yeah. some people were like, oh man, they're putting the chair lift yeah. in. And then as soon as they do, you're like, oh, actually, this is sweet. <laughs> it's inevitable, right? We, we took it in stride, yeah. Just, you know, just gave us better access to go further out, right? Mm -hmm. Quicker, right? Like when they put in seventh and then they put in the T-bars, you can just get out of balance way quicker. You can go deeper, right? Do you have a favorite? Kind of Maybe the question is, do you have a favorite spot or a zone or like, do you have a favorite memory from a specific line that is just like, that one sticks out to me? Yeah, probably uh, with Trevor, the north face of it, Simmons, when we, uh, like we did that and Alpine Trekkers and Lying Boots and we just bivvied and yeah, just kind of climbed this north face of Decker. So, so what was that? Or a north face of Fitzsimmons, which is, you know, the headwaters, first drop of water that goes down Fitz Creek, right? Mm -hmm. Headwaters and spearhead range type thing. So that one sticks out in my mind, yeah, probably the most, yeah. How come? Uh, it was just kind of the pinnacle back in those days and uh, it, it only seen about, I think, one ascent. So I think we were first, second ascent and first ski descent. Yeah, and yeah, it was just kind of a, a pretty cool pinnacle. I remember rolling into the village and I think it was 89 or something like that. And, you know, so kind of rumor on the street we were going to do it. And there was a bunch of guys sitting in Merlin's. As I think we rolled in there or something like that. And they were like, oh, just, well, did you guys ski it? Did you do it? And, yeah, yeah, we skied it. We did it. It's it's yeah. funny that those those kind of vibes still exist, yeah. even for stuff that's been skied a bunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, oh, did you, was those, were those your lines? You know, yeah. Was that, yeah, yeah, we were out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So would you go, would it be like, was that a two-day mission for you? Yeah, two-day mission that one was, yeah. Yeah, so you'd yeah. go just build like a little snow cave or what would that be? Yeah, I think we just slept underneath a rock in a windrow. 
right? Yeah, we built a snow cave, yeah. S- sleeping bag, like his back. Yeah, in, a sleeping bag and a thermos. A, yeah. a burlap sleeping bag. Burlap, burlap sack, sack or... and leather boots, <laughs> lace up boots. And no, no. no <laughs> back in the bad. day. Yeah, we were pretty good. Yeah, pretty cozy, you know, just a little MSR store. We went super light. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, we, I think on that, because we wanted to have downhill bindings on. Mm-hmm. And we, so we brought our Alpine trackers with us on that. So uh, we didn't bring our Emery's because they're a little bit unpredictable and sketchy. They're pretty low din and uh, they're kind of plastic. So they were susceptible to break in, in, right. in colder temperatures. Yeah. So we went Alpine gear, Alpine boots. And Did Alpine you ever have boots. a point where the, that stuff kind of broke on you halfway out there? And oh, like, yeah. oh, crap. Yeah, lots of. We, did you just like wrap some duct tape around a ski pole yeah, as a backup yeah, kind of thing? Is yeah. that pretty much the, the no, no touring uh, mode for three days? Ski turn with no touring mode for three days. Lock down heels, stuff like that. Yeah, whatever. Duct tape, wire, whatever you have. Yeah, you can, can you imagine? I mean, yeah, I can. <laughs> Same thing happens. You <laughs> yeah, know, just with the sled, you just yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to fix strap it. Strap it up. Make sure you can get out. Yeah, oh, I guess so. Yeah, right on, man. Um, you got polaris on your shirt there mm-hmm. are you riding with them again this year yeah yeah for sure are you gonna so you the last time uh, like we were talking about trying to do you know backflips and stuff like that you were kind of recently you were kind of obviously skiing is your thing but you're kind of snowboard uh, snowmobile professional now as well do you find yeah. that the, the you're getting drawn into a bit more of that like is, is your uh, demands for your time kind of push towards that as well yeah i just try and keep the balance it's nice to change it up and just like go sledding for a day you know it's almost it's easier on the body kind of gives you a bit of a break right. or easier on the body for some people and do you have other like <laughs> sled specific sponsors as well as other yeah. than polaris yeah yeah lots of parts and stuff like monster andrew monster is squamish guy local guy yeah i used to work with that guy uh, driving mm-hmm. hummers yeah I back in driving hummers. Oh, yeah. then we got cfr dave yeah local guy, i mean yeah. he's legendary snowboarder too see if our racks the people cheated cheated yeah, factory yeah, racing, cheated factory racing. Yeah. Yeah. and uh yeah yeah i don't know it's nice i like doing everything you know try right, everything spice life, you know? <laughs> yeah right and then yourself do you just set, do you rely on him for getting skis or do you still get oh no, up? Rosie still sets us up yeah yeah you got one of those like legacy legacy deals I, yeah I, yeah, it's, yeah it's a pretty good deal you know with oakley uh Ros and all and uh you know our Tarek still sets me up with an outfit so yeah, that's great you know I don't ask for any money, but yeah, it's yeah. nice to get the gear. And, right, right. Yeah, right. I super appreciate it. They just know? send an email every year. Hey, give us an order. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's basically what they say. Give them a wish list and usually shows up, right? If it doesn't, oh, well. Mm-hmm. And there's that nice synergy, Your too. Because you, you were originally Rosie and Oakley for years and years, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Bet, yeah. Is that kind of how you ended up getting connected with the, the crew as well? Yeah, they they knew sure. They yeah. knew your dad and they're like, well, this, yeah. your kid's actually yeah, pretty yeah. good. Why? Well, yeah, I grew up skiing on... His yeah, it was kind of a key, you got. know, when we put in our wish list, you know, they say, oh, what do the kids need? So we put it in the wish list. It was kind of a family deal. It's kind mm-hmm. of neat, you know, it was kind of the time and era where, you know, your sponsor took care of you. And then as I grew and expanded my family, they took care of my family from my wife to everybody, right? Because mm-hmm. they know Parvian's the mummager. So, uh, yeah, she gets stacked out pretty good, right, for taking care of everybody. Still and, does. Yeah, she communicates with all yeah. the sponsors on Logan's behalf, on my behalf, and, uh, yeah, it works out pretty good. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, it's nice to have those relationships. Macintosh, Ian, was talking about that um, as well last time we, we spoke, and he was talking about the importance of having those long-term partners and sponsors rather than kind of jumping around as, you know, some people end up doing just because it makes more financial sense at the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. But having that long-term sponsor and knowing that, you know, maybe I'm not going to get paid in 10 years, but I always know I can get connected, yeah. Yeah, hooked up sure. with a pair of skis or I can get right. my kids some stuff, right? It's just, it's kind of a good yeah, thing going I, on. I haven't changed. Like I haven't left Oakley or Rosignol. No. They've been, been wearing them since yeah, and they've been day good one. And yeah. Been, well, I'll still keep doing it. Great equipment. Yeah. I remember yeah. when you won that uh, Kicking Horse event, that 98 pointer where you launched yeah. off that thing. You're like, Mark, did you got a pair of Oakley sunglasses? And I'm like, no, because oh, you didn't yeah, really have it. Podium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> I'm like, no. I'm like, you found something. You figured it, you, you figured it out. You figured it out. So, and then now that we haven't hit winter yet, I got to ask you guys. So, <clears throat> I might and I might start bringing this up again. So, in the past, I've heard a hundred different theories as to what the winter is going to be and why. So the most recent one I had was my neighbor. So I don't know if you know this year, but there's an unbelievable amount of pine cones this year. 
more the more so coming off the trees more so than normal is that a thing i don't even know yeah, yeah. like one year i had these uh these people the this these japanese uh kids that i worked with he's like oh it's gonna be a good winter i'm like why it's because the mushrooms so we had a fall a wet fall and there was tons of mushrooms like way more than normal it's like because the mushroom nature knows right and then i remembered that the day as i was talking to my neighbor and he's like, look at all the cones, pine cones. There's way more pine cones this year than there normally is. He's like, the nature knows. He's getting food for the squirrels. So that's going to be a long, cold winter, right? So do you guys have theories or thoughts on why this will be a good winter or a bad winter? I'm pretty yeah. wake up and look out the window. <laughs> I don't, I mean, Walking I just, away, dude. I don't, whatever I do is not going to change the weather. So I just take what comes. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm superstitious, but you know, the mountain ash berry, right? Or your big mountain ash berry might mean it's a good winter. The ash berry? And, yeah. And I always believe to like where we live on the West Coast, mm -hmm. we seem to get the same amount of precip precipitation every year. It's just a matter of when it comes. So it's been a dry four or five months. So we're due, right? So I like your you know. stuff, right? I'm a big fan yeah. of the, I'm a big fan of the wet spring, nice, nice fall. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll yeah, hold I'll you. take that. Yeah. Right. And we'll hold you to yeah. it. But I like that same kind of a rough amount of moisture. It just depends when it comes. That's it. Yeah. That's I like that's a good one. I yeah. like that one. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks guys for uh, allowing us to come into your into your shop and uh, have a little chin wag. I know a lot of people have been waiting to hear Eric Payota on a podcast. <laughs> there you go. Now that we've cracked out, cracked the uh, yeah, <laughs> cracked the seal, we'll get you set up for your own <laughs> story time with Eric. <laughs> story. Time. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on. I'm just like the tag right, for the next one. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Logan, have a great season. I'm sure I'll see you. you as well. We'll see yeah, you on yeah. the hill and we'll yeah. talk to you soon. No, we'll catch up. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. You've been listening to the Low Pressure Podcast, the podcast for skiers. This has been a Redmark Media production.